Welcome and hello. This is a video tutorial in HECRAS, and in this lesson, I'm going to be discussing the development of the 2D computational mesh. The computational mesh will control the movement of water through the 2D flow area. So, what I have on the screen here is the web page from the 2D user's manual for HECRAS, and development of the 2D computational mesh is the topic of today's lesson. All right, I'll go ahead and leave a link to this page in the description of the video. And now what you're seeing on the screen is the heck RAS uh, user GUI file GUI at the top with RAS mapper opened up down below. As you can see, I already have a number of elements added to my RAS mapper, including the blue river, the bank lines in red, the flow paths in cyan, and then the cross sections in yellow. On top of that, I already have a terrain. Actually, that's one terrain. Here's another terrain as well as a map layer. Wait, no, took the map layer out. Okay. All right. What we're going to do is add a computational mesh. So what that involves is going up to our geometry file, which I have created here. It's called base and then click on edit. Looks like I'm already editing. If not, you can just go right click, start editing, but it's already editing. So that's why the option here says stop. And what we're going to start editing here is the 2D flow area, which is right here below storage area and cross sections, at least in my menu, and then go ahead and click on whichever parameter within the 2D flow area you want to start editing. I'm going to start with perimeter. So I'm going to check perimeter on. I'm going to click perimeter. So the text is bold and magenta. And then I'm going to come over to my map and click on the add new feature button. It looks like that was already clicked. And now I'm ready to start editing and adding in my 2D flow area. So to assist me with this, I may want to toggle on the terrain data. And what I'm going to do is focus on this river and specifically outline the areas of the cross sections. The cross sections are these yellow lines right here. So I'm going to zoom into the top part of the reach and then just give a single left click and then another left click. And then I'm going to zoom out a little bit, left click, left click, left click. Another way to actually pan is to right click. So I'm going to just right click over here and it sort of recentered my map wherever I was located on that right click, left click, left click, left click, and I turn the corner here. I also like doing the middle mouse button, just kind of dragging over left click, left click. Also, if you find that the background imagery is distracting because I don't really think I need it, I can also toggle that off in the middle of editing. Yep. So I'm still editing left click, left click. And then the final click is going to be a double click. So I'll go ahead and do that. Now it's asking me for a name for that perimeter. I'll just call it perimeter one. It's the only perimeter I'm going to have for this video. So that's fine. I'll click OK. And I should probably also mention before talking about this editor page is that the perimeter needs to be drawn within the confines of the terrain that is associated with that particular geometry. And that was definitely the case for us. Now we're seeing a dialog box here for us to define the actual mesh for that uh, inside the perimeter that we just sketched out. So if I'm not ready to make these edits, that's fine. I can just click close and then my perimeter is right here on the map and go ahead and click on the edit feature and then right click edit 2D area properties. This brings that box back up or I can also do that by clicking on perimeters and edit 2D area properties. This is the only 2D flow area that I have here. So that's why it's the only option in my drop down. But if I had multiple 2D flow areas, it'd be listed in this drop down right here. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit before I start editing. So there is my area. And then I will again, right click edit 2D area. I'm going to bring this over here. Now what I need to specify is a number of different properties for that 2D flow area. For instance, the spacing on computation points is in feet with a DX DY. So this is the horizontal separation on the map, the vertical separation on the map. And 100 feels a little bit too small. So I'm going to go ahead and type in 400. And it looks like it copied that over to the DY field as well. Next, I'm going to click this button to generate computation points. And what you see over here is that grid has been created. So my cells are 400 feet by 400 feet, I believe. Or sorry, the, the computation points are spaced 400 feet apart. So yeah, in most situations here in the center with square shape mesh cell sizes we have, it'd be 400 by 400. What it's telling me over here on the side is that the number of cells is 240. So that's probably a pretty good amount at least for the overbank areas, but I may want to have a higher density computation point and hence smaller cell size with more computations within the main channel, which is uh, between the two red bank lines here. 
Okay, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So the actual computation point coordinates within this perimeter here that we just created can be viewed by clicking on this button here. And it shows me all, I believe, 241 coordinates. Yep. So this is a X and Y, which in this case would be like a an easting and a northing that's based on my coordinate system. Okay. Let's go ahead and check out those cells, and then let's uh, revisit this dialog box a little bit later. So I'm going to click close on this right now, and then let me zoom in and then toggle on computation points over here in the left panel. So I click that on. I checked it on. It's ready for editing. Now we can see the actual computation points, these points right here. If I need to make edits to these points for whatever reason, then I can click on yeah, computation points. I'm already editing. Click on the edit tool and say I want to move this point over to the side. Then boom, it's moved over. And not only that, the cell has actually reshaped based on its uh, neighboring uh, cells. I can add a cell, or, sorry, a computation point. So I'll just go ahead and click on add new feature. Computation point layer is selected. So I'll just click here. And now I've got two cells. There's a third, there's a fourth. I'm going to go ahead and delete those cells now. So go back to edit, select the cells you want to delete, click delete, or just click the type in the delete button once the cells you want to delete are highlighted. And then now we've got uh, some missing cells or some missing computation points. And the cells you can see are getting larger because there's fewer points. So I've made some edits here, but if I wanted to regenerate the cells, no problem. I'll just go back up to, let's see, click on perimeters or right click, edit 2D area properties. And then with 400 and 400 here, I can just go ahead and click on generate computation points again. This warning is just basically telling me, hey, the existing edits that you made previously are going to be overwritten. That's fine. That's what we want. So I'll click OK. And then we're back to where we were with our original 400 by 400 grid within this perimeter. OK, taking a closer look at these cells once again, the user's manual does provide some definitions on the cells. Here we go. There's a cell center cell face and then cell face points the cell center is right here this is the dot in the middle of the cell well it's it's not necessarily the centroid but it's it's close enough this is where the water surface elevation is computed for the cell and then over here we see uh, arrows pointing to the cell faces faces are generally straight lines but they could also be polylines in the event that they're on the perimeter of the boundary of the 2d flow area and then the cell face points right here you can Consider these like the corners of the vertices. They are used to hook the 2D flow area into 1D elements and into boundary conditions. All right, so back to our RAS mapper. And then I'm going to click on to edit the 2D flow area once again. The hydraulic cell face properties box right here gives us the ability to set a default Manning's end value like 0 0.06. That's fine. Typically, this is the this is the default value, but these numbers can be overwritten. Once we add in a land use layer and then associate different land uses with Manning's end values. Also, we can click to spatially vary Manning's end values on the spell cell face and composite classification values in cells. This gear button right here allows the user to change the tolerances used when creating the hydraulic properties tables for the 2D cells and the faces. So when I click that, I see the different tolerances that I can add in. There's a number of different values right here, but I'll just kind of, kind of go through the first couple to give you an idea of what they are. These are all thoroughly explained in the user's manual. Oops. Yeah, so the first one, cell elevation volume filter tolerance. That's the first one here. Cell minimum area fraction. The first one here, cell elevation volume tolerance. The default value is 0.01 feet, and it's used to reduce the number of points in the 2D cell elevation volume curve. So the larger the value here, then the fewer the points and then the faster the computation. The next one down is cell minimum area fraction. The default value is again 0 0.01. This value is multiplied by the cell area to establish a minimum area at the lowest elevation of the cell. And that helps with stability. And then there's a number of other parameters here as well. I'll just go ahead and assume the default values and then click OK. This button here to compute the property tables, this is to run the 2D flow preprocessor for the mesh area. We're not ready to do this yet because we want to refine our mesh. Specifically, we want to modify the main channel and add some uh, more computation points. And we'll see how to do that in just a moment. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close that. Next, we want to modify the mesh. So for instance, this is just the perimeter and the default spacing. Nothing really special yet. 
but we have a few other options such as break lines and refinement regions that I'd like to talk about. In general, the cell size of the 2D float mesh should be based on the slope of the water surface in a given area. Where the water surface slope is flat and not changing very much, you can get away with larger cell sizes. However, when you expect high flow changes or even larger changes in the geometry, that's when you're probably going to be wanting to use smaller cell sizes. Smaller cell sizes may be required to define significant changes to geometry and rapid changes in flow dynamics. All right, so let's talk about break lines first, and then after that, refinement regions. I'm going to click on break lines, make sure I'm editing, and then let's come down here maybe to the, the downstream end of the reach. Break lines can be added uh, either before the mesh is generated or after, but regardless, if it's after, then I can regenerate the mesh, and then it will enforce that particular break line. Break lines should be added at locations that are considered barriers to flow, such as levees, roads, or natural berms. You can add them either by hand or by adding in a shape file or by just typing in values as um, x, y values into a table. So I'm going to demonstrate by hand. So what I have is break line selected, click add. I'm going to go ahead and add a break line that's just barely outside of this particular bank line. Yeah, so break line and bank line, <laughs> these are different lines. I'll just go ahead and do a single left click and then another left click, left click, left click left click. The last one will be a double click. Now, in reality, I'd probably trace this break line along the entire reach, or at least until I'm past the end of the perimeter. I'll call this break line one. You can call it whatever you want, then click OK. As you've noticed that the cell boundaries, the cell faces have aligned to those break lines a little bit, you can kind of tell. Here, let me toggle off some of these other lines here. So the bank lines are gone, the flow lines are gone, the rivers are gone, and the cross sections are gone. Okay. So now you just see the mesh and the break line. That's easier to see. Next, what I want to do is enforce the break line, which will recompute the mesh based on that break line. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. You can do that a few different ways. Right click and enforce all break lines. And now you can see that the mesh has now accommodated that break line using that same 400 by 400 approximate cell spacing. I can also click this button here to enforce all break lines, but nothing would happen now because it was just enforced. No changes have been made. All right, to edit the break line properties, you can um, click on the edit pencil here, select the break line, and then right click and uh, edit break line properties. We only have one break line now, right now, but if we had others, we can add them to this table just by going new break line here. And then um, you could specify the XY or you could upload a, uh, a shape file. To do the shape file, it's, oh, yeah, this button right here, import lines from a shape file. And then, like I said, the third option was to actually type in the values for X and Y. And to do that, you'd click on this button over here to the far right, and boom, here are the points. So I clicked um, and defined six different points to define five different line segments for my one and only break line right here. But if I wanted to change the X, Y value of any of those vertex points that define the polyline, the, the break line, then I can make those edits here or I can remove or add rows as well. So anyway, let's talk about these parameters here. There's near spacing, near repeats, and far spacing. I'm going to move this over here. All right, so near spacing is the mesh cell size along the break line. So keep in mind that we used 400 as our computation point spacing. So for near spacing, if I put it at 200, then I'm going to have twice as many computation points along the break line on both sides of the break line. So if I click OK, I now have to click Enforce. So I can either, yeah, right click, Enforce all break lines. And now, boom, look at that. We have computation points are now twice as dense along the break line on both sides. Okay, I'm going to highlight the break line once again. Right click, Edit Break Line Properties. The near repeats, what this does is it allows you to repeat the near spacing X amount of times. So right now it's not repeated at all. It's just one time. But if I wanted to repeat it a second time, I'd go ahead and put a one right here. Click OK. Now what I'm going to have is a second row of the 200 foot spacing. Here's the first row. Here's the second row. On the other side of the break line, here's the first row. I'm going to have a second row in just a moment when I click this enforce all break lines button. And boom, like I said, we have two rows of the 200 foot computation point spacing on both sides of the break line. OK, let me go ahead and take that back. So right click edit. If I wanted to make it three or well, three rows, I'd say two repeats. Click OK, click Enforce. I can just keep going that way. All right. Anyway, 
edit. I'm going to take that out. I'm going to just leave it blank. These are optional. Next, instead of 200 for my near, near spacing, I'm going to make it 100. And what's going to happen now is the cell spacing will be 100. But what it does at each layer is it doubles until it reassumes the cell spacing of the original perimeter, the original mesh of 400. So we're going to have a row of 100. The next row will be 200. And then the all the other rows outside of the first two rows will be 400. All right, so there's 100 there. I'll click OK. Now I need to click Enforce. And this is what I'm looking at here. The first row is 100, very dense. The next row is 200, less dense. And then the row after that is 400. And that's true for both sides of the break line. Okay, let's uh, open up that break line properties once again. Far spacing, what this does is it allows the user to control how far the software will increase the cell size as it gradually transitions from the near spacing to the user entered far spacing. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and just delete that and then click OK and then enforce. So right here. All right, looks good. Computation points cannot have more than eight neighboring cells. So when you see a red dot like this pop up, and this will occasionally happen, then there are a lot of easy fixes. For instance, I could just go ahead and add another computation point, maybe move this one down. So I'm going to click on computation points, edit, and then select this one. I'm going to move it down. That may fix it. OK, so that fixed it already, but I'm going to just add one more. So I'll click on add, click, click a dot right there. OK, that fixed it. So this one right here, this cell has one, two, three, four, five, six. This cell right here has one, two, three, four, five, six neighbors. Right. So they can have up to eight without it being a problem and without seeing that little red warning dot. The last part of this lesson is to use the mesh re, uh, refinement regions. So what I'm going to do is toggle off the break line and I'm going to toggle on the bank lines and the rivers. Right. So what I may want to do for this model is to actually outline the bank lines. And if I want more detail, more computation points within the bank lines, it's not uncommon to want to have to do this. I could go ahead and sketch out a region here. Refinement regions, add. Let me go ahead and just start sketching. So single left click. Boom. This time I'm going to sketch out the entire area. So now I'm at the top of the reach. Now I'm going back. I'm just going right outside the red bank line here. And when I'm ready to terminate, I'll just go ahead and double click. All right. So this is my region one. I could call it whatever I want. Maybe something like main channel or between bank lines would be more appropriate, but I'll just go with region one. Click OK. And now what I want to do is edit some of the properties for this region one. So I'm going to right click on refinement regions, edit refinement regions. Here's my region one right here. Now the cell size originally it was 400, but maybe I want something more dense. So for cell size here, I could say 100 and then 100. I'm going to leave perimeter spacing and near repeats off and then just go ahead and click OK. And now I want to enforce the refinement regions. That's this button right here. And then boom, what we're seeing here is a lot more computation points within the main channel. This is a mesh editing tool that allows the user to modify or override the existing DX and DY computation point spacing within the specified region. This is called the refinement regions. All right, well, that was it for this lesson. We talked about 2D flow areas, specifically adding the perimeters, adding and editing computation points, break lines, as well as refinement regions.